Well, this is an Easter like no other. Very, very different. Uh, this is kind of like the day that uh, most pastors realize that they are going to be uh, preaching in front of the largest crowds that they'll have all year long. And uh, this Easter, pastors are either preaching their Easter message from home, or maybe like me, they're preaching in front of an empty worship center with cameras. Or how about this? Some of them have already recorded their Easter worship and uh, their message, and now they're at home uh, worshiping and listening to their own message. Pretty cool. So uh, it, it's very, very different, right? Some of you um, have been, haven't been in the presence of like other real, like physical presence of human beings for quite some time now. And there are those of you that also are probably, um, maybe you're with roommates or uh, family, and you've kind of liked in, in a sort of way, like having this time because you've been like passing one another like ships in the night, so active and, and, and all of a sudden you've kind of got this slowdown and now uh, you can spend some time together. And then some of you are like, okay, that's done. I'm ready to get going now. I'm feeling very cooped up and these walls are closing in on me. And so it's a very, very different kind of Easter. And, uh, this whole virus thing, who would have ever thought at the beginning of 2020 that this was going to be a major shakeup in our lives, right? Over 1.7 million people around the planet um, confirmed cases and uh, over 100,000 deaths and uh, over half of the world on lockdown this Easter. 17 million Americans filed for unemployment over the past four weeks. Washington Post wrote this, we have not experienced the magnitude of this number of layoffs and economic contraction since the Great Depression. And probably the most significant contagion of all is not the virus. It's worldwide and widespread fear. You see, there have been many Easter's where if we're honest, we can say, you know, we just kind of went to an Easter service and checked it off our to-do list and uh, went out, had dinner, and uh, did an Easter egg hunt with the kids. But I don't get that feel this Easter. This Easter's different. Because you see, there's a lot of fear right now in, in your life and in mine. And uh, a lot of the things that anchored our lives before, four weeks ago, a lot of people that, that anchored their, their futures and their security and their, their money or their retirement fund or their job or their career or success, how quickly those things all were kicked out from underneath us. And so this Easter, we come seeking hope because the real question is, when will it end, right? Are we, are we somewhere in the middle or are we, are we anywhere closer to where we'll eventually come back to life as normal? And then when we come back, is life really normal? Today, I want to celebrate the true anchor of our lives and the true hope that we can claim today. And that anchor is found in Jesus. You see, the truth is in your life and in mine that um, we're, we're really in this together and we need hope like never before. And uh, the resurrection of Jesus has not been canceled. And while you might be on lockdown, the, the loving kindness of Jesus and the power of his resurrection to change hearts and lives, that's not on lockdown at all. This Easter or in any time of history. 
So today, let's celebrate. Um, and I want to pray with us before we start. So if you would bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day called Easter, Resurrection Day. For in this day, we are reminded that you bring hope even in the greatest hours of darkness. And that when everything is said and done, yours is the victory. Because he lives, we can live also. Because of the resurrection, we can have hope in this hour and for all of eternity. Today, we place our hope in you and we pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk to you about today is this. The resurrection of Jesus changes the way we face our fears. I want to focus on one verse that um, actually uh, comes before Jesus is ever arrested and betrayed and then goes on to be crucified. Um, Jesus is with his followers, and he's told them that uh, he is going to lay down his life. He has told them that uh, one of them would betray him and that they would all run and scatter. He has told them that in that hour that he would be leaving them and that where he was going, they could not follow him, to which I'm sure that was very disconcerting as a, as a follower of Jesus who had spent three years. They'd given up their, their homes, their careers, everything to follow him. And now he says, where I'm going, you cannot go. And so Jesus, in these final words, these are the final words that Jesus offers his followers before he is arrested. And he wants to bring a word of encouragement to equip them for the days ahead. And this is what Jesus said to them. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. You see, by virtue of us living 2,000 years after the resurrection of Jesus, I think sometimes we have a tendency to not appreciate the irony behind these words of Jesus to his followers. At the very moment when one of his own is brokering a deal to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus pronounces victory. At the very moment where his enemies are concocting this, this whole uh, deal to, to bring him up on uh, charges and then eventually to be turned over to the Romans for execution, at the very moment that Roman soldiers are preparing their instruments of torture that would be used on the Son of God, at that very moment, Jesus says that he has overcome the world. How can Jesus proclaim victory right in the middle of chaos and trouble? You see, most of us can really get into a good victory story. We love those kind of stories in life. Like, you love to hear about a person who is an alcoholic who has been sober for 20 years. If you're struggling with addiction, you're like, man, if they can do it, then maybe I can too. We love to hear the story about Walt Disney who was fired from his job, I think at like 22 years of age because they said he wasn't creative enough. And he goes on to found the greatest theme park in the world. We love the story of Michael Jordan who was demoted from the varsity down to the JV team because his coaches just said, well, he was just kind of mediocre as a player and he becomes one of the greatest basketball players of all times. We love the story of a pastor who, who leads a megachurch of 10,000 people who talks about the early days when it was just him and his spouse and two other couples doing Bible study out of their homes. We love to hear about these stories of victory. But we love to hear these stories because they're already won. The victory has already been claimed. But why pay attention to anyone who announces victory before victory has happened? No one tells stories in the middle 
of the story. Because in the middle, that's the place where there's despair. That's the place where there are a lot of questions and a lot of confusion. You see, in the middle is a place where you've left the familiar behind. You're not where you used to be, but you're certainly, you haven't arrived. You're just kind of like in the middle, right? No one's interested in hearing Walt Disney tell his story in the middle, right? I just got fired from my job, but I'm eventually gonna create a magical kingdom full of ducks and dogs and mice. Who, who really is leaning in on that story? Or who really wants to hear about some kid playing basketball at Laney High School whose, te- whose uh, coaches have demoted because they said, well, he's a pretty good ball handler, but he's mediocre at best as a defensive player. And his shot's not all that great. Who wants to hear the story of the alcoholic when they're like, I have fallen off the wagon three times, but this last time was different. I will never take another drink. Who's really listening in to the pastor who, uh, well, I'm no longer in my home. We move to the elementary school cafeteria now and we have 50 people and I got my very first paycheck. Because you see, stories in the middle, announcing of victories in the middle, just don't carry the same weight. So there are only two choices that we have when it comes to Jesus announcing victory in the middle of chaos and trouble. Either he is a lunatic who is lost in his own fantasy world, or he is who he says he is. And he knows something that we don't know. You see, Jesus can announce victory even in the middle of the mess because he knows the end of the story. He knows the end. And in the end, he wins. I love, I was was watching a basketball game one Sunday afternoon and uh, I called one of my friends. We follow the same team, one of the same teams. And I was, it was at halftime. I was like, man, is, this is an exciting game. I think it's going to come right down to the wire. And my friend said, yeah, I think it's going to come right down to the wire too. He said, in fact, I think that we're going to win it on a shot on the last buzzer. And I said, man, that would be awesome. So I watched the rest of the game. And then at the end of the game, guess what happened? A shot at the last second at the buzzer and our team wins. And uh, I went to ESPN to kind of look up some stats of the game. And I found out the game had been played three days earlier. My friend had just decided, I guess, to play along. But you see, it's incredible to think of someone announcing victory before victory has happened unless they know something that we know and they are who they say they are. But you see, for most of us, it's hard to see victory when you're in the middle of the story. We're now four weeks into this pandemic, into social distancing. And I don't know how it looks like in in your house, but... In our house, it's beginning to feel a little bit like the movie Groundhog Day. It's like you wake up and you put on that same pair of sweatpants. You put on that same pair of shorts. You might throw on a collared shirt if you got a Zoom meeting for work just to look a little more impressive. But things look strangely familiar every single day. You know, you're high-fiving and celebrating in your home when you score a a, a thing, a toilet paper, right, at Publix. And then for some of you, four weeks in, it's like, for you, you're not putting on the collared shirt to go do a Zoom meeting for work. For some of you, you've lost your jobs. For some of you, you've been put on furlough, which you know, you don't have enough work and you're not sure when, when or if you ever get that job back. For some of us, we just feel like we're lost in the middle 
And you see in the middle, there's no easy answer. There's no overnight success. There's no magic pill that you take. We are in the middle of an unprecedented season of anxiety and fear and confusion. In a place like this, it's easy to lose sight of what life used to look like. And we're not quite sure when we're ever going to get to the other side of this thing. And when we do, is it going to be a new normal? Are things going to be changed forever? It's difficult to imagine a new day when all you feel like right now in the middle is this surreal sense that things are not the way you had hoped they would be. And you're not sure if they ever will. And so Jesus, speaking to his followers in the middle of trouble and chaos, says this, in this world, you will have trouble. See, Jesus doesn't pretend that all of life is rainbows and butterflies. Jesus acknowledges that in life, there are difficult questions. There are not always simple answers. Life does not boil down to a short verse, Bible verse you can put on a coffee mug to solve all the difficulties in life. Many of you are not sure you can pay your bills. You're like, you know, I'm I'm grateful for the financial incentive, but that's just a drop in the bucket for where my life is headed right now. And Jesus is calling attention to this reality of living in the middle. Jesus understood, though, that trouble is far more than a virus or or an economic challenge in your life and in mine. Jesus understood that trouble had its origin from the very, very beginning. And if, you, if you're new to the faith, that the story of our understanding of the, of the creation is that God created all of this beautiful world and God created human beings and God looked over the human beings he created and he called them very good. He created you in his image, which means you are a person in the eyes of your creator of significant worth and value. No matter who you are, no matter what your circumstances, no matter your skin color, your nationality, your bank account, or whether you have a job right now, you are loved and dearly valued in the eyes of your creator. But the creator created humanity with freedom because how in the world can you truly love if you cannot make the choice to love or to not love and so God created us with freedom and in that freedom we had the potential to either walk with God in this new relationship or to turn and to go and do life on our own terms and that's what happened early on in humanity and because of that All of this beautiful picture of shalom or or peace that God had created in this world became distorted and fractured. No longer were relationships easy but complicated. We can attest to that. There was a separation as a consequence between ourselves and our creator. The world no longer works as it was intended to work. And so we live in a very real day of viruses and hatred and racism, cruelty, selfishness, greed, divisiveness. And Jesus knew that that the root of that trouble runs deep in the heart and soul of humanity. And Jesus showed up on this planet as the embodiment of a God who had never given up on the humanity that he had created, who pursued us in love, who demonstrated the very heart of the heavenly father 
ultimately when he went to the cross. Jesus did not go to the cross because he felt like you and I needed, you know, we were pretty good, but we needed a little tweak. So he came as a life coach. No, Jesus didn't come as a life coach. He came to save us because he realized we were in a whole world of trouble and we could not save ourselves. Only a savior could do that. He did what we could never do for ourselves when he died on the cross for you and for me. And if the story ended there, then we are still hopelessly stuck in the middle. And there is no hope. But Easter, Easter testifies that the grave was not the end. That he arose on the third day and on that we celebrate today. So Jesus says, in the world you will have trouble. But then he goes on to say, but take heart. That word heart in in the Greek means Courage. I love that. But take courage. In the world you have trouble, but take courage. And and we might be misled to think at this point, Jesus is kind of going brave hard on us, right? Like, just hang in there. You can do it. Stay strong. Be courageous. And we've certainly seen that happen over these last four weeks. We have seen medical personnel and and military personnel, men and women who have stood between us and this pandemic and have, have been there to put their lives on the line for you and for me. We've seen nonprofit organizations who have stepped in to to help administer compassion to the most vulnerable among us. I mean, let's be honest. I would even see finally after three to four weeks in, we finally seen some courage take place in our country with people finally realized this is a serious illness. Who would have ever thought at the start of 2020 that courage could be defined in the first quarter of this year as remaining distant and sitting in our homes and watching Netflix? But that's exactly what what this kind of day has been about. But when Jesus talks about taking courage, Jesus ties in courage with something far different. See, Jesus ties courage into the midst of our fears, not with trying harder or being more brave. Jesus ties courage into his ultimate victory. Take heart. Why? Why? Because I have overcome the world. The very reason we can overcome and have courage in this hour is not because we have overcome, but because Jesus has overcome. You see, on that Friday when they took down his beaten and battered body, they placed it in a tomb. The dream was over. Fear and panic set in. I'm sure the disciples were thinking, well, Jesus, you said you were gonna overcome the world. How did that work for you? There's a lot of questions in the middle. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of anxiety. Our faith testifies On the third day, he arose. And because Jesus is alive, it changes everything. Because of the resurrection, you and I can have hope in this hour. You see, it is the irony of this unwanted hour of your story and mine, right here in the middle, that Jesus pronounces victory. There are still questions still concerns, still bills to be paid. But in this very moment, because he lives, when you have a relationship with him, you will live also. 
And he will take us through any and every storm of life. Not because of our strength, but because of his. And this is the message of Easter. He who conquered the grave and sin and death now stands in your corner. If you have placed your trust in Jesus, he holds you up in the middle of this storm when nothing else will. I can ultimately take courage in the middle of the story. Not because of government leaders or doctors or pastors. Not because of my success or my bank account or my circumstances. But because I am loved by the one who died for me and was raised again on the third day. And because of his resurrection, I have an anchor that no storm will ever move me because of the one who is my strength. You see, if you have placed your trust in Jesus, he is the only anchor of hope that I know to share in this hour. He is your redeemer. He is your comforter. He's your shelter. He is your resting place. He is the almighty conqueror. He is the one who is the firm foundation. He is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is at his name that darkness trembles. Death could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. He is the king of kings and the prince of peace. Nothing in all of life can separate you from his love. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And while you and I are in the middle of it all, his victory is sure. You see, Easter means that even, even in the middle, even in the midst of my fears, I can wake up every day and trust my uncertain future to the certainty of the one who has overcome death. See, we don't have to live in fear because we know at the end of the day, Jesus is the one who gets the victory. I don't know where you are in your uh, journey of faith right now or I know for me that while I've placed my trust in Jesus, uh, I, I'm no Superman. I mean, I'm in the middle of it just like you are. And there are some days that you'd look at my life and say, man, he's got it all together. And there are other days I got a smile on my face, but inside there's anxiety and concerns just like everybody else. But I know even in the midst of the middle, even in the places where I might have some insecurities, God is still on the throne. He is still strong and mighty to save. I have watched him over and over and over again in life help people find a new future. I have seen God bring healing into people's lives and their marriages. I have seen people who had lived their lives as they had been defined from their past and their brokenness and their shame and guilt. I have seen them come to know someone who loves them with an everlasting love and seen them no longer live looking in the rearview mirror of their life anymore, but looking ahead because the one who overcame death was now their Savior and their Lord. Our only hope, our only hope is in Jesus in this hour. And so for some of you, I, maybe you've never experienced the hope that is found in Jesus. 
Maybe for you, for, for most of your life, you said, well, as long as I got enough money in the bank account, as long as I have a job, as long as I have someone that cares about me and loves me and my family, as long as I have a little bit of success, I'll be okay. And maybe, maybe for some of us here today, you'd say, everything that I placed my hope in has now been kicked out from under me. And you're just searching. I want you to know today that there's someone who is an anchor in the storm. And it's Jesus who ultimately conquered death for you and for me. And because he lives, you can live also. And you can find hope in an hour where you feel like all hope is gone because he meets you right in the middle of your mess today. And he can do in your heart and in your life what you would never be able to do on your own. You see, the risen Christ is still at work bringing hope and life and freedom into a world filled with trouble, into your world and mine. So today, if you would like to place your trust in Jesus, I wanna give you that opportunity. And I'm gonna pray a prayer and then um, if you would just join me in making that your prayer. You see, what God is after is not religion. God wants a relationship with you. That's why it's important that, that we make a decision to place our trust in Him. And so if that's you today, I'm gonna pray this prayer and you just simply make it your prayer today. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. God, I don't know what to do here in the middle of all this. It feels pretty heavy. And all the things that I once placed my trust in are now all been kicked out from under me. Today I place my trust in you. To the one who has conquered death, to the one who has overcome the grave, I place my trust in you. Come into my life and do what only you can do. God, come into my life and heal the brokenness in my heart. Give me a new reality and purpose to live into. Give me the assurance of eternity that's found in my relationship with you. Thank you for first loving me, for never giving up on me. I place my trust in you as Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. Today, if you made that decision, I want you to know that it's the most important first step you will ever take in your life to a brand new future and a hope that is beyond the stuff of this world. And so, congratulations. And I want to encourage you not to just kind of walk away from this moment alone, but, um, you know, reach out and let someone know. You know, it's our desire that, that we could partner with you. In fact, if you look on the chat space there uh, right now, uh, there'll be a, a digital re, um, gift that we would love to give you just as you begin to take this first step in your journey of faith. And uh, we hope that that'll be very, very helpful to you as you do that. And uh, for the rest of us today, um, this is a day to celebrate, even in the middle of the mess. So I wanna encourage you, to stand. Maybe you've been sitting there on the couch the whole time. And I want to encourage you to stand. Stand in this moment and let's celebrate that the risen Christ is greater than any isolation. The risen Christ is greater than any sickness. The risen Christ is greater than any weakness. The risen Christ is greater than any financial disaster. The risen Christ is greater than our hopelessness. 
The risen Christ is greater than any storm you might be facing in life. The risen Christ is greater than your loneliness. The risen Christ is greater than all depression and anxiety. His perfect love cast out fear. Today, let's celebrate and sing about the one who is our living hope. Amen.